Good morning, everybody uh, from Indianapolis, where the snow is melting. I know that's good news for me, if not you, but welcome to Cars and Coffee, where I'm going to talk about some tech, some answer questions, and we've got some pretty cool things to talk about this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about some wheels. We're going to talk about some uh, chassis support, and depending on if our technology works, either a B6 Mustang or a uh, Crown Vic. So uh, we, we always... We, you know us, we always struggle with technology because nobody here is under 30, and that, that presents a challenge. So, uh, also, if uh, I look a little splotchy, uh, don't adjust your, your, your picture. Uh, this is the week I went to the dermatologist to be tortured, uh, and I went through without a whimper. And uh, it's, I'm, ever since I lost my oldest son, Paul, uh, to uh, melanoma cancer uh, the year after he won the Farley World Challenge GCS Championship, I am, I am a big proponent of, of uh, sunscreen and going to the dermatologist regularly. So, vitamin pardon? And vitamin D. And vitamin D. <laughs> I forgot that part. Anyway, there's my health talk uh, for what it's worth. So, see, going down the list today, we're going to talk about chassis support, either uh, Paul Dondero's uh, V6 or Crown Vic. Uh, and Forge Line Wheel, we're going to talk about Forge Line, three piece Forge Line wheels. Also, uh, we're going to talk about some, some chassis support stuff. Uh, Rich keeps getting questions. He tells me he gets questions that people ask, is the, is the weight of uh, like a chassis, like the matrix system, uh, worth it? Uh, short answer, absolutely yes. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, we've got some, some, some good questions today. And, uh, of course, did I have to say this is Kenny Brown? I do. This, this is Kenny Brown. <laughs> And, and welcome to Cars and Coffee again, if you're just tuning in. I got that in earlier this time. Uh, and, okay, don't forget the thumb thing. That really helps us. And the uh, little uh, wrenches that kind of look funny. And if you're on YouTube, and if you're on YouTube thumbs too. Yeah, and just click the subscribe and click the bell. I don't know if you heard that or not, but I have to. If you're on YouTube, subscribe and click the bell to get notifications of future episodes. And Facebook. Uh, Live, you can share with your buddies. So just hit, the, just click the share button, and you can invite people in if, if you think what we're talking about will be of interest to them. We love to have them. Uh, also, I'd like to take uh, just a second to thank all of the Speed Therapy Speed Therapy Society members that join me for my special uh, reveal, my private reveal on my new rear suspension system. Uh, I think I pretty much blew everybody's mind. It's it's interesting. We did the first private reveal to the uh, Speed Therapy Academy guys, and we sold out the first batch of, uh, of ten of the first batch of ten of the rear suspension. A Thursday night, we gave it to the uh, shared it with the Speed Therapy Society people, and again, we sold out the next lot of ten, and we're working on the, almost sold out two lots of ten. So the rest of you are just going to have to wait to the to the general introduction later this maybe April, May, somewhere in there. But we want to be sure this is such a complicated piece. Uh, it's, it's difficult to manufacture, but what it does to the handling of a Mustang is unbelievable. So uh, that'll be coming up clo closer to when the weather's really nice. So anyway, th thanks for those that attended. Thank you. And we've got the, did the videos go out yet that we couldn't technology. Yeah, one of them was not available in Grand today. Okay. Yeah. For those that were there, they know that, you know that we had uh, the technology thing. We had two videos. We had picture but no sound. So we're actually, for the people that Speed Therapy Society, people that registered for that, those videos, one video went out uh, already. I think the other one's going out today. So you'll, you'll have that uh, because the videos are pretty good. I mean, you're really going to be impressed uh, with what's on the video. So let's see. So we've got some quick here questions. Let me turn to my question sheet. Do what? Okay. So we should do the Forge Line wheel first. Forge Line racing wheels. Okay, this is a this is this is this is a sub. You know, we have substitute teachers. We have substitute products today. We were scheduled to introduce a new uh, new uh, uh, sports seat or track uh, from from Impact, but uh, like happens in this industry, it didn't arrive in time. And anybody that's ordered anything in the aftermarket is uh, knows that's kind of a common thing. Uh, you know, we deal with it all the time when we're building cars. It's like, where is this stuff? Anyway, it didn't arrive, so we just happened to happen to have a, 
Rory's rear wheel, we just got back from Forge Line uh, this week from being repaired. He was in an accident. Uh, actually, somebody ran into him. It wasn't his fault. And the wheel got bent, so we sent it off the Forge Line, and they repaired it, which is kind of a cool thing about three-piece racing wheels. So let me adjust my little camera. I'm going to cut the top of my head off. And, oh, I forgot. We still have Kenny's Wild Horses up there as the artwork, which was uh, a piece that was commissioned by Carrie on my birthday in 90, 96 uh, by Ron Burton, who is a really, really well-known motorsport artist here in Indianapolis, actually nationally known. He has kind of a very unique style. If you saw this up close, it kind of, you go, wow, that's pretty cool. So let's, let's talk wheels, specifically Forge Line three-piece racing wheels. Now, when I say three-piece racing wheels in Forge Line, there's the First, most important thing to know is the center is forged. It's forged aluminum, which means and forging is done with like, uh, you start with a chunk of aluminum and use a massive press, pressure and heat, and kind of squish it and turn it into a wheel and it gets machined. So when I say three piece, this, this really shows the three pieces really well. Now the, the, uh, the forged center, we just saw, but here is the, the outer shell and the inner shell aluminum and the, there's, there's a couple things that are nice about this when we're especially when we're, we're working with race cars and we're doing some testing especially new cars working on wheel sizes uh, it's really easy to change the size of the wheel if if you want to take a half an inch off the outside you just get an outside shell that's half an inch shorter and if you want to take a half an inch off the ins or an inch off the inside you get an inside shell that's an inch shorter or vice versa so it's, it's pretty versatile on uh, adjusting wheel wheel widths. And this is an 18 by 13, which is a pretty good size wheel. And even so, it still only weighs like 23 pounds. I think a factory wheel of this weight would weigh at least twice that much. Or this size would weigh twice that much. So you can see the outer shell, the inner shell, aluminum. You spin it around here. And this is the, 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 third, the third piece is the, uh, the Ford's center. Now I'll spin this all the way around. Bang. And you can say that you can see by the inside, this, this really is a racing wheel because you can see all the stuff that's stuck to the inside. But uh, if you ever <coughs> raced, you know what it is. But this this particular wheel has a pattern for the, the Mustang. But you can see all these little bolts all the way around are what hold the wheel together. And there's there's a gazillion of them. So there's a pretty good seal and it's pretty strong. I never counted them. There's a bunch, but that's that's how a three-piece wheel is held together with all these little screws. So that's kind of like a, a forge forge line racing wheel. Uh, we use we use two <coughs> new different guys. <coughs> like I say, when we're, we're building a new car, we'll we'll start with a three-piece wheel, and then once we're pretty confident. We've got the, the wheel width and the offset right. Well, that's something else too. You can change the offset by just by by switching the hats side to, you know, in and out. You can move the offset in and out. So once we're confident in like on David's car that we're building, once we're confident with the the, the wheel uh, backspacing and the wheel size, then we'll go ahead and get a set of a one piece racing wheels uh, made for us, custom made at Forge Line. So here we are. Oh, and then those that haven't been with me very much, this is my trusty toolbox that's been with me for over 40 years. And between me and that toolbox, we've been to every major racetrack in North America and won a lot of races. So, uh, and in fact, I still use it every day. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not just somebody that doesn't know his way around cars, and I know my way around cars. Because I made my living out of that thing for a lot, very long time. So, we need to get on, move on to... Uh, what we are going to talk about today. Okay, it looks like I'm going to talk about Crown Vicks here in a little bit because we're having technical issues with getting Paul's video up. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of cool. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul Dandero uh, started with a set of our subframe connectors on his S197 V6. And he, when he got the V6, I mean, he just he, he looked at, at the, the specs and he saw that it was like 300 horsepower, which is pretty much the same as the five to uh, five to uh, ten. Uh, three valve mustangs so I mean, he got that and he he started with our subframe connectors and it made such a difference 
Uh, actually, that, you know, that stuff right there, back S197. Jacking rail is a matrix. Okay, it made such a difference that he went ahead and got the full suspension on there. And he just, uh, uh, we get that video up next week, maybe you'll see that he, he really creates a stir at Road America. Uh, everybody wants to come up and, and see what the fire I mean, is so quick. Now, the BH kind of just blasts down the, the straightaway on him, but when it gets to the twisty bits, I mean, he is all over them. Uh, and uh, you know, everybody wants to know what's in his car. And when he finds the V6, they go, what? And, but then he tells them he's got a full Kenny Brown uh, AGS 4.0 suspension system, which is the, uh, you know, what we, our Gen 4 suspensions, advanced geometry suspension system, Gen 4 for the S197s. But cool thing is Paul's really, really going to be even faster next year because uh, he's, we've got a set of JRZ shocks for him, which, you know, that's our, the shocks I have custom built for me in the Netherlands to my specifications. And I'm, uh, I'll, I'll put uh, a custom, uh, individually pick the springs for individual customer, depending on their use. But he's also adding a new rear suspension. So he's upgrading his car to a full AGS 4.5, which is the next generation of uh, AGS suspension systems. Like I say, you, know, you have to wait to the spring. Otherwise, the people are going to have them probably going to be out there kicking some butt. So, uh, from that, I'm going to move on to questions. Uh, let's see. Angie Parrish, uh, we're curious, is this is this the end Angie Parrish that's from Indy with the yellow Mustang? Uh, if you're out there, let us know. He, she wants to know the importance of actual wheel weight and or tire weight, if any, and could uh, could he, I guess me, talk about tires and the quality and the kind I use, uh, I've, I've had success with. Okay, wheel weights, you know, the weight of a wheel is really, really important. Now, not so much if you're just driving around town, uh, but if you're on track, uh, the, the weight of the wheel has a big impact on what's going on. Uh, we've had people, even myself, when we switch, from a set of like, you take the standard OE wheel and tire package off and put like a forge line on there. I mean, it doesn't take very long. You can feel the difference in the steering. I mean, the steering feels lighter, uh, the car moves better. And the reason for that, there's two things that, that you're doing when you reduce the weight of the wheel and tire, because the like the factory wheel is like 30 some pounds and our forge line, it's the uh, 19 by 10 or 19 by 11 are in the, like the 20 pound range. So, I mean, that cuts a, that's a lot of rotating mass. Also, the performance tires, like we use the, the uh, probably Corsa, which I'll get to in a minute, are lighter than a factory tire. And you can just feel that. So there's two things. Number one, it reduces rotating mass. Okay, wheels and tires go round and round, just like on the bus. And, but they, it's, 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 it's mass. I mean, you've got to take energy. It takes energy to move something and put it in motion. So if you get something that weighs a lot less, it doesn't take as much energy, energy to put in motion. That's the first benefit. The next benefit is the, for the suspension. If you got, if you reduce the, the mass, not the rotating mass, but just general unsprung mass. And unsprung mass, unsprung weight is what's not suspended by the chassis. So wheel, tire, brake, that would all be considered unsprung mass. So you reduce unsprung mass. And what happens is the, the wheel uh, moves a lot, a lot quicker. Uh, it's a lot easier to control from the shock. Uh, it's it just, you know, it's just, you know, if you had to lift something up that's, that's 10 pounds, lift something up that's 5 pounds, there's a big difference. Well, same thing with your suspension. If it's got to move, a, you know, a 30, 30 pound, 40 pound wheel entire package up and down versus a 20 pound, I mean, that, that's a lot, takes a lot less effort, which means the suspension reacts a lot faster. So that's kind of like, you know, the, the, the lighter wheels really make a huge difference. In, in a number of different ways. So, and our other question is uh, talk about the, the tires, the quality of tires and what we've had success with. Well, there's, you know, there's a lot of really good tires out there. I'm not gonna talk about all season because, you know, we, we're we talking summer tires here. But in the, the max performance category, uh, for the street tire that you can take to the track, uh, the, the one that I kind of prefer is the Michelin uh, Pilot Sport. It's either S4 or 4S. That's a really good tire and a really good track tire. Then the one that is almost as good as that is the Super Sport. So those those are good street track type tires. Now on track, there's there's three types of tires we typically use for track cars. 
Uh, I know there's a lot of good ones out there, but I mean, I've kind of pretty much found something I like and stuck with it. I mean, the first one is the P0 Corsa. Uh, I've been using that tire for a long time. I mean, I really like it. It's, uh, it, it's, I mean, it's, you can just feel the grip. It's a really grippy tire. Uh, it also has a little bit of tread on it, which means if you get caught in a downpour, uh, you don't have to worry about sliding off track if you got like uh, slick tires. Uh, in fact, a story about that, we were at Sebring and I had, uh, I can't remember, the editor or somebody in, in my car was taking for a ride. And we no sooner got through turn one, heading for turn two. And as typically happens in Florida, the sky is open and just a, just downpour straight down. And uh, I just, you know, I kind of slowed down a little bit, but I really didn't like crawl around. And he was just holding on, thinking we're going to slide off the track. And we didn't. I just kept driving. And as soon as we got back, we had to wait like for 15 minutes or so until the rain stopped. First thing he did was jump out and he looked at the tires. He wanted to know what tires I had on the car that would do that. And also the courses, if you watch Formula One, uh, they have the tread pattern is somewhat uh, uh, resembles the intermediate, uh, Pirelli intermediate uh, Formula One tires. So that, that's kind of like the one I use the most. It's got pretty decent tread life for a track tire. The other Pirelli that's, that's super sticky is the uh, Trofeo R, which is like this short of a race tire. And I say that because the Trofeo R, uh, when we do when we do tire temperatures and pressures. Now, if anybody's been with me for a while, know I'm just I'm, I'm just adamant about getting tire pressures, tire temperatures, so we can set tire pressures. And with a DOT type tire, at the end of the day, after working through the temperatures, we typically will have four different pressures on all different, uh, four different corners because we're asking each corner, each tire, and each corner to do a different job. Now, obviously, the left front works the hardest, right rear works the least. So we end up with different different pressures at the end of the day. The Trofeo R is actually built on a race type carcass, but it's still a DOT tire, which means like on the Pirelli slicks, uh, we work to specific pressure. Uh, Pirelli slicks need to run somewhere between 30 and 34, and 32 is typically where we run them. And and it's just it, you just set all four of them the same pressure, you know, 30, 32 or 34, or sometimes we do you know. 34 in the front and 32 in the middle. But anyway, but it has to be a specific pressure. Now the Trofeo R's they fall in that same category. I mean that you don't you don't set them like a DOT tire. You work to a specific pressure, and surprise, it's the same pressure range as in for the Pirelli Slicks, which is uh, 30 to 34. Again, 32 seems to work the best. Now the other tire that kind of falls in between that that a lot of our customers use is the Michelin Pilot Sport 2. Pilot Sport 2. Yeah, and that's that's kind of as far as treadwear. Now I'll go back to treadwear. Now Trofeo R, is because it's I mean it's I mean, it is like this short of a race tire, and it is super sticky, super grippy. Uh, that means it's going to wear out sooner than like the, the, the Corsa and the the uh, the Michelin Sport Cup seems to fall right in the middle as far as wear. Uh, also on, on the on the grip category too, it's kind of like between the two. So those are the three track tires I use, uh, have the most experience with. And of course, a lot of our, our club racer guys will run Hoosiers, uh, but for you know, I don't know that that's the best tire to run for track days. Uh, I don't I don't like people running sl slicks to track days. It uh, uh, slicks will create bad driving habits because you know, street cars are not engineered specifically to run slicks. You need a, you need the right springs and the right shocks to run slicks and be effective. And I, I tell people. Some people think they're going to be really quick and go out and buy some because you can get used slicks, you know, pretty reasonable. Go out and get a set of used slicks. And, uh, you know, the two things are going to happen. Either they're going to drive off the track because they're going to think they're, they got, you know, they're, they're, they're Mario and ready. And then all of a sudden the tires let go and they're, they're lost. They don't know what to do. Or they're going to wear out the outside edge in the front. And that's because there's so much grip in, the, in a slick versus a street tire that there's, there's no slip angle. Uh, street tires have a slip angle, which is, means they'll get to as much as they'll give, and that's pretty much it, which means the car will roll about this much. But when you put a, a super a sticky slick on that, that doesn't have much slip angle, all of a sudden the car's going to roll a whole bunch more. Uh, because, I mean, the tire stops and the car doesn't, so to speak. So when, you know, with a street tire, you know, the car and the tire kind of stop at the same point, but you put a slick on there, slick stops, and the car keeps rolling. Mustangs have what's called a positive roll front suspension, which means the more the car rolls, the more positive the uh, the the, uh, uh, 
alignment goes. And positive camber is when the top of the tire sticks in, no, out. Uh, and the bottom, and the and negative is when the top of the tire sticks in. So you want always run, that's why we run like two, three degrees negative camber on S197 Mustang is so that when the car rolls in a corner and it goes to positive roll, then all of a sudden the tire's flat and you're getting maximum grip. Now, with just a little side note on our, on our AGS suspension for 197s, there's only three, three elements to, to my S197 suspension, rear grip kit, front grip kit, springs and shocks. But on the front grip kit, I do a lot to, I make a lot of geometry changes, uh, and I dive, uh, roll center, caster gain, camber gain. So with, with AGS and, and the right spring setup, you don't have to run quite as much negative camber because the, you know, the, the, I, I make geometry adjustments so that, you know, you don't have, the car doesn't roll so much and the tire doesn't go positive so much. But anyway, that's why they put slicks on and they wear out the outside edge of the tire pretty quick. And it'll, it'll give them like really bad driving habits. So I just, I strongly recommend people don't get a set of, of used slicks and put them on their car for the track. And I have a. I'm just waiting until you finish because I want to say something about Angie Parrish. Oh, okay. So you wait until I finish. <laughs> so anyway, it's kind of like, you know, if you're, if, even if you run like track tires on track, you really need. A better spring and shock package. Even if you don't uh, do a geometry change, uh, you need to have far more, the, the stickier the tire, the more spring you need. Because, like I say, the tire will stop going and the chassis will keep rolling. Uh, you know, people that run slicks on on like stock Mustangs, you know, stock Mustang has maybe a 150, 170 pound front spring. Uh, Pirelli slicks on like like Paul's World Challenge car with motorsport shocks. Uh, we'll run spring rates like 850 to 1,000. So, I mean, there's a big difference between 150 and 850 in spring rate for slicks. So just just please don't run slicks on a, on a stock car. Uh, you have to have to have more shock. You have to have more spring. You have to have better geometry. That, that's just my opinion. So. Uh, yeah, just real quick, you were answering Angie at Parrish's. Yep. Um, I, I don't think she's from Indy. And she has a 96 Cobra and an 07 Shelby. So we were wrong oh, cool. on the car, but yeah, so. 96 Cobra, I had a 96 Cobra, the Red Rocket, I loved it. In fact, it was in a whole bunch of magazines. You know, supercharged and, and I had AGS uh, 3.0. .3 and then we did Kermie, which is my, uh, it, was, it was a, 2001 v6 that ford wanted me to do because they were having problems with v8 motors so we did a v6 for for sema but that introduced ags 3.5 which was the age it was just irs from 99 to 04 uh, cobras so uh angie that i hope that answered your question uh if you got any more you know don't be afraid to set up a 15 minute consult and i can talk to you about tires wheels and tires uh so and then lee wants to know what kind of coffee I prefer? Serious coffee. What do I mean by serious coffee? What do I drink the most of? Well, because I drink really strong coffee, uh, I mostly drink during the day decaf espresso. But the other coffee I drink is French roast. So, you know, both of those coffees are, you know, uh, you know, string of black, just straight coffee. Or, you know, I would say pretty party coffees. Uh, I think there's, if, you know, there's, there's, there's one coffee that I had at, at one, one point in my life that uh, was the strongest coffee I've ever had in my life. And it was coming back from uh, a West Coast race or running the Celine program. And it was in a, in a truck stop in New Mexico. And I mean to tell you, you, know, you, you talk about wide awake coffee. I don't think I slept the whole rest of the trip. It was it was pretty stout. So and anyway, I, I like pretty. I mean, I like coffee that's not not really you know super stupid strong, but coffee that's got it's got robust and good flavor, which is you know espresso and and uh, French roast are what I drink the most. Okay, now BC wants to know if we could cover the uh, the Crown Vic. This this is kind of like our default if we if we couldn't get uh, Paul's video to work. Uh, you know, the default was going to be uh, 
to talk about the, the P2 Panther. <clears throat> Otherwise, the P2 Panther would go to next week, then we talk about Paul this week, so we swapped them around. We just we just love this technology stuff, I got to tell you. Uh, okay, so Paul's question is, can I cover the, the build of the P2 Panther that was featured on Motor Week TV? Uh, my personal car, yes, it was. And uh, he references a, a video. I think we'll probably put that video up uh, either sometime either later on, on the, the society. And yeah, back back <clears throat> we did <clears throat> a lot of we did a lot of crown supercharged crown Vicks, uh up until 2002. And 2002, they came out with a Marauder. Or 2003, they came out with a Marauder. So 2003 and four, we built a ton of supercharged Marauders. And in both cases, we had to develop our own supercharger package because nobody built one. And what kind of started the whole Brown Vic thing is a uh, car and driver came to me and uh, they want to do an article on, on a uh, you know, sort of a, a cop car that Crown Vic, uh, something that looked like a cop car, but was, was you know, had great performance. It was really quick, had great performance. So uh, we, you know, we, we started working on, on the whole Panther platform and uh, came up with a pretty good package. Uh, we did our own supercharger and we actually blew one motor up in the Fort Proving Grounds up in Detroit with the, the, uh, the calibrators trying to get it right. But we found at the second motor, we got, got the calibration right. Because this is the first one we did. And, and you know, I have a three time rule. The first time you do something, you learn what not to do. Uh, the second time gives you a chance to figure it out. And the third time you sort of get it right. But anyway, the car that, that we did, it, uh, it was supposed to be a two-page article, and they liked the car so much, it turned into a six-page article, and they dubbed the car, so you can see this, and put that, uh, they dubbed the car the Lounge Lizard. And you can actually go online and, uh, and uh, Google uh, Car and Driver Lounge Lizard, and the article, I think, is, is still available. It's hard to do this when you go backwards, but that's the start of the whole Crown Vic thing. Which is the lounge lid, lounge lizard, which uh, which was pretty cool. And just to go over the build, what we did for it, uh, obviously we did we did a, our own custom supercharger package. We used an Eaton supercharger, uh, and then we did uh, obviously it was intercooled because you really need to keep superchargers cool. Uh, it was uh, air to water intercooled, and then we upgraded the fuel system, uh, injectors, mass flow air, mass airflow. Uh, we uh, recalibrated the processor, obviously, and by this time we were connected with another uh, calibrator at Ford who was doing the processors for us. And then let's see, uh, let's see what else we did. Uh, oh, we re removed the battery to the trunk, primarily, not necessarily for weight, but to package the supercharger. We had to do some routing for the, uh, for the supercharger, and you know, the battery was right away, so it got move that to the back like what we do for Mustangs. What else do we do that? Uh, oh, we made some adjustments to the transmission so the shift had much crisper shifts uh, because I think the worst thing to happen is put a whole bunch of power into a Crown Vic and, and you're driving hard and you go to shift gears and Wah. So we made a bang, it just shifts real quick. Uh, see, we put true dual exhaust on it because uh, a lot of the cars didn't come with dual exhaust back there and um, high performance had actually three choices in mufflers, anything from you know neighborhood uh, exhaust up to we call it authoritative, uh, so, and and oh, I went beyond that called aggressive. So we had three different exhaust packages we could put on them. Let's see. Okay, so we we developed a, a subframe system. Uh, everybody knows I'm into subframes, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. And let's see, uh, and we did sport touring. We changed springs. We changed shocks. Uh, sway bars, uh, just the front sway bar, not the back sway bar. And uh, we have we upgraded on like the factory uh, style wheels. We had 255, 50, 16, but we also had a 17 and 18 inch wheel option. Back then, 18 inch wheels, ooh, those are big. <laughs> Today, they're you know, not, not that big. And see what else did we do. Oh, this is kind of neat. We put a dead foot, uh, a, a dead pedal your left foot in there because uh, everybody knows that you know if you're going around the corner you need to brace that left foot so all our must all our performance mustangs back then had a had a, a dead pedal for the left foot so we put one in the crown Vic. we actually had to create a special bracket for that 
And then you know, all those were built just one at a time. You know, back then, the the, uh, the Panther package. Now this this these numbers are just crazy. I mean, you, you could you could buy the Crown Vic for like twenty nine, uh, and then the uh, the Supercharger package was about twenty. Uh, to do that same package today would almost cost twice as much. So it's kind of, it's kind of cool. And then we had also had a high output option, which we we cranked everything up. Uh, and uh, that was n another uh, six grand. So, you know, you know, 55 grand back then was a lot of money, but it was a lot of car. But then like in 2003, we had zero inquiries on Crown Vicks. Everybody wanted a Marauder. So we developed a Marauder package. And this is, this was car and driver. It doesn't say what year. It had to be 2003 or 2004 by Larry Webster. <laughs> but there, there's the, there's the Marauder that was in car and driver, Marauder S. And then also uh, it was in Auto Week. And uh, that was the article in Auto Week. It was pretty complimentary. In fact, Auto Week, uh, Dutch Mandel was one of the, the uh, main big editor guys, uh, had it for like a weekend or so. And his kids referred to it as the Berserker because these, these Marauders were fast. I mean, they were really, really fast. Uh, you know, you get next to like a Corvette stoplight you know, see you later. Uh, they were really quick. So that's kind of like the story on Crown Vix. And we're going to try to get that video put up for you somewhere. But I think we're, uh, we need to probably move on to our show and tell, which is chassis support. Uh, now I mentioned for the Marauder that we did uh, a subframe system. And a subframe, our, our chassis support goes all the way back to 1986 on the Celine. Uh, Celine, our endurance Mustangs that we built, uh, we added jacking rails so we could do because endurance 24 hour races, you got to jack the thing up a lot. So we did, we did uh, jacking rails in, uh, in 86. SCCA declared that as a extra chassis support. So I, I took a hacksaw and made teeny little, two teeny little cuts in it so it not, could not be considered a continual, continual brace. And 80, 87, they didn't even look at it. So that was kind of weird. Anyway, we that went into our Mustang line in you know about 80, 88, 89. Uh, but you know the Mustang without without a full cage, the the Fox Mustangs were pretty twisted. They were, they were like a tin can. Uh, I mean, we actually had people come in that had the floor had torn right behind the driver. The floor had torn from the, the outer edge all the way up to the the, the, uh, the tunnel. Uh, so that's how that's how how much they twist. So we'll start with, with jacking rails. This is, this is, this is, that's a long one. That's from the Fox S197, and they weld to the, the pinch weld. That also is for Gen 1 Mustangs, too. He's the same one for Gen 1 Fox SN, S197. For SN95, it's a little bit of a different platform. So we came up with this design which has these little holes that, you know, kind of the little pins that go through, they have to have a place to go. So we made this a little bit different. In, in all cases, it, it, we do a stitch weld to the, you know, the pin, we do stitch weld with the pinch weld line along the, the rocker panel. So that you can jack it up any, anywhere along the rocker panel, you can jack the car up, which makes it super handy. And, and then you put jack stands uh, underneath it on the outside, it leaves a hole underside of the car to work on. Uh, and but what we do for our, our track cars and race cars is we'll actually put a little arrow on the rocker panel uh, where the, the best point to put the jack, you know, to, to balance to put one side up at the same time. And then on the, on the jack, you put a piece of tape. And once you push it in the piece of tape, just jack it up. You don't have to look for anything. Now, on the, on the 550 cars, we had to do something completely different because their, their underbody is, uh, is the chest is a whole bunch of different. But this is actually a fabricated jacking rail. It's not, uh, it's not a tube like what everybody else does. And it's fabricated because there's, where it bolts the chassis, there's, there's a five degree pitch. So what we did is we, actually it goes like that. We offset them. So this bolts flat to the chassis and this is parallel to the ground uh, where others are like, like twisted or and anyway, it's, it's a really, really slick system. Like I said, it's fabricated, not, not a tube. Nobody else does that. So that's the outside. Now, getting, getting outside the jacking rail, 
And then the, the next thing we came to market with was the subframe connectors in Fox. Uh, now we pioneered, this is the design that I pioneered and everybody's copied. That's what we call a double cross subframe connector. You can see it's got just a little bit of bend in it, which matches up to the chassis. It's also got this double cross, this, this, this uh, mid feature we call the double cross uh, subframes because one on each side is double cross. And what that does is that actually bolts to the, to the rear seat uh, bolt or the seat, or the seat bolts to the floor. Uh, this bolts right to that, which does, which does uh, two things. One, it helps in twist. It doesn't let it twist. It's just like, you know, people, people ever put up a yard sign with just one, one post, things just flop around the breeze. You have to put the cross to keep it from flopping. The other thing it does, it reduces the span versus capture ratio between how much of the, the subframe connector is in, like, in the free span and how much is captured. So it kind of cuts it in half, so it just it makes it super strong. Then after we do the subframe connector, the jacking rails, uh, you need to put them together. You need to make, make them work together. That's when we came out with the matrix brace. Now, it's interesting. I, a lot of my stuff is copied in the aftermarket. Nobody's really copied this exactly because they don't think they understand it. But the whole purpose is, is the, the inside goes to the jacking rail and the outside goes, I mean, the inside goes to, to the, the subframe and the outside goes to the jacking rail. We actually cut these, or these are made a little bit long uh, because every car is different. So you actually cut them to size and you weld it in. What that does, that puts four full triangulations under each side of the car. Now, uh, if, uh, if you've taken my uh, Speed Therapy Academy, you know, all of that triangulation building race cars, because that's, that's, a, that's a whole chapter is a chassis. And we talk about triangulation. Oh. Serial, yeah, we, we, something else we had to do a long time ago is uh, I've copied so much, all of our parts come with a serial tag. And if you don't see that serial tag, it's not a, a genuine cane ground part because I sometime I have to go down a list of things that I brought to market first and everybody has copied. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's the system. And what it does, it just takes the twist up. Now, people ask, is the, is the, the weight worth the benefit? Absolutely. No question about it. I mean, the weight is, I mean, for, for a Fox, it's 42 pounds. SN95 is 43 pounds. For S197, it's 24 pounds. The thing is, the, the weight, uh, and 550 is 18 pounds. The weight that's added is low. It's way below center of gravity. It's like as low as you can get in the chassis, which is a good thing. Secondly, is like, you know, I said the car twists. What makes the car twist? Power, horsepower. So when you put your foot on the gas, those chassis will actually twist. And we had we we're doing the Fox cars, and we could jack the front wheel up and everything else off the other three wheels stay on the ground. But we would put the, the matrix system in there, you jack one wheel up, and then the other wheel on the same side comes up. So I mean, there's there's a lot of twist, and it's like it takes horsepower. It's the chassis twist does does two bad things. One, it robs horsepower. If you're, if you're putting your foot down. Secondly, it becomes uh, a sort of a spring. Uh, and it's an uncontrolled uh, fifth suspension member that, you know, you don't have any control over. You know, at the four corners of the wheels, you got springs and shocks. And the shocks control the springs. Well, when the chassis twist, and there's nothing to control that. So we have people that, that first thing they notice, like Fox and SN95, go drive away, and like 10 minutes later, the car and man, it's a different car. I mean, it just, it, it takes away rattles and squeaks. Uh, it makes handling more precise. So it, is, it, is, it, is the added weight worth the benefit? Uh, 10 times more value in, in, the, in the benefit than the weight. So for those that, that are curious about that, and that's, that's the first, any, any, any car we do, uh, Fox SN95, 197, the first thing we do is stiffen up the chassis. Because the suspension isn't going to work right unless you've got a rigid chassis. I mean, the race cars that we build, there's so much, so many tubes and so much triangulation. They're just, they're really rock solid. But that's what you need to make the suspension work is a solid platform. So that's the answer to the question. Now, speaking of questions, I think I've got through everything I was going to talk about today. Uh, okay, I've got you. Here we go. Uh, do the thumbs up thing and little wrenches if you're on Facebook. 
uh, on YouTube. We make some thumbs up too. That always helps. And you'll be sure to share this with your friends if you think they can get value out of what we're talking about. Uh, I think next week we're going to talk about. Uh, oh, we're going to talk about. Hey, spring's coming. Driving season. Uh, what do we want to do to get our cars ready to drive? And they've been you know, kind of in, in the garage all winter long. You know, a lot of people go out and sit and pet them, and let them know they're not forgotten. Uh, while the snow's outside, but you know, there's things you know we want to think about doing as you bring it out uh, for the new season, whether it's a track car or a street car. Uh, sort of the same things all apply. And we're going to be talking about uh, Cliff Glidden's uh, 2008 uh, Ford Racing FR 500S that we are upgrading to Kenny Brown FR 500S to uh, 2011. World, world, 2011 World Challenge specification, because in uh, the Mustang Challenge series ended in 2010, actually, and it's one of the cars I actually engineered for the Mustang Challenge, uh, and then uh, there's no place to go with the cars, so <clears throat> with an update kit, uh, they were allowed to run the, uh, the 500S in, in World Challenge, uh, which was with my suspension and uh, Ford Racing heads intake and hot rod cams, so that's what we're doing, except we're taking take it plus even a step further. Uh, we, we pulled off the sack shocks that, that came on the car because I, I always struggle with those shocks. I, mean, I wish they had picked a better shock, but you know, if everybody's got the same shock, it doesn't matter for a, a one mark series. So we upgraded them to single adjustable HRZs, which are much easier to manage and a, a much, much better shock. And he's gone AGS 4.5. So if he gets this car back, it's going to blow his mind just how good it is. It's close to leaving. Yeah, it's getting it's getting pretty close. I mean, we're with all race cars. I mean, the last ten percent takes you know most of the time. Uh, but we're kind of working through all the little things that, that when you go in race cars that, that happen. So, uh, also we have um, Paul Dondero next week. <laughs> so okay, I'm going to try again to have Paul Dondero on with his video on his, his V6 Mustang. Yeah, the interview is awesome. He is an awesome guy and very yeah, he's a really interesting guy. Yeah. And after the video, I'll tell you something about him that he doesn't mention himself. Mm -hmm. Okay, so questions for today. Get on. You are talking so much. So if anybody has topic. questions, please uh, add them to the chat. Sure. Questions. Start sending those questions in. See if you, it's, it's Stump Kenny. See if you can stump Kenny. <laughs> oh, Here, here's the thing. If you do stump me, I'm going to tell you that I don't know the answer. And this is... I've got this engineering brain. I just don't understand BS. I just can't deal with it. So if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you. If you don't know the answer, I'll try to answer as best I can. So Bob Jones, who is one of our Speed Therapy Academy alumni, and just got some four-joint wheels, has a question for you. Can you say in a few words about cleaning, inspecting, and maintaining those wheels? Uh, cleaning, yeah. I mean, it's, did he get the uh, one piece? Um, I can't remember. Bob, why don't you comment whether you got the one or the three pieces? Yeah, either way. I mean, just there's there's some good wheel cleaners out there. Uh, you don't want, if they're powder coated, you don't want to put anything really harsh on them. You want to sort of use mild stuff. Even mild detergent works really good. But, you know, keeping them clean uh, is always a good idea. You know, our race wheels, every, after every race, we clean every wheel. So they're ready to go for the next time. Uh, as far as inspecting, uh, just visual inspection. I mean, it's it's you're you're be hard pressed to find a forge line wheel go bad. I mean, it just doesn't happen. Did you but, mention that we're going to try to get uh, Steve Shard on? Oh yeah, I think we're going to try to get the Steve Shard from Forge Line on maybe next week. He doesn't know this yet. Oh, not next week. We have too many things to cover. Uh, maybe the week after that. Uh, but he's he's a pretty interesting guy. He was one of the he he held a master class for a Speed Therapy Academy and talked through wheels. And every time he talks, I learn something I didn't know. So it's it's pretty informative. So okay, the next uh, this is just a comment from Rory Wallace. Um, you had a 15 minute with him, I believe. So anyway, um, I have always been told saving one pound of on-spun weight is like saving four pounds of overall weight. Uh, I you know I've, I've never heard that, but I will agree with it. Uh, even though I've, I've never heard, I may have heard it, but I don't remember. The one to four. Yeah, but I absolutely agree with that. Uh, unsprung mass is just you really want to get rid of unsprung mass which is why light wheels like forge lines are a good idea. And Angie Paris actually was trying to uh, copy Kermit uh, in her green V6, 2000 green V6. Oh, cool. Yeah. And I think that's what uh, Paul Dondero's 
doing too. Yeah, on, on Kermie, what we had was uh, we used the Cobra R wheels, which were 18 by nine. And I ran the P0 courses that I talked about, uh, 285, 35, 18. And that, that, was, that was a great uh, wheel uh, uh, tire package. Uh, nowadays, what I would do is I'd go to an 18 or 19 by 10 and still run a 285, 35. Okay, and then uh, this is the next question from Rory Merrick, who is uh, from Canada. Um, I'm sure it's been asked before, but can you put an IRS from like a 2015 or S550 into a Fox? What is the real issue? I hear it's too wide. <laughs> There's bigger issues than that. <clears throat> you would have to basically cut most of the back of the car off and re-engineer the whole back of the car. Uh, you know, for a, for a Fox, the, uh, the IRS off the 99 Cobras, uh, 9904 Cobras, I mean, it's, it's a clean bolt on, I think for, depending on what year Fox, you might have to drill one hole. Uh, but it's, <clears throat> it, it fits right up there. You know, we've got a full range of parts. We got, we got, you know, we got four different phases of upgrades for, for the IRS package because we are the only people in the aftermarket that support 9904 IRS or IRS packages. No, but nobody else does it. We do. I mean, we've got control arms, coilover shocks. We've got, you know, four phases, and we'll talk about that sometime, all the way up to uh, modifying the carrier with uh, a chain, you know, cut all the pickup points off and put them back on. Uh, people that follow me know I'm just nuts about ge getting the right geometry underneath the car. So you know, I, I would, you know, forget the 550. Uh, it's, I'll give you another little secret is, uh, Nobody from Ford's listening. I'm not a big fan of the IRS and the 550 cars. Uh, and the reason for that is it, it's kind of, it, it's, they've done a lot of things that are, I'm sure were, were focused on, you know, they had, they had uh, overall objectives. What I have found is that for people that turn all the nanny devices off, I mean, there's like I think three levels of nannies in the 550 car. If you turn all the nanny devices off, I have seen a number of 550 cars back into the wall or guardrail. Uh, the, the back seems to get, without, without the nannies, the back seems to get pretty loose. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> I, you know, Fox, stick with it with a, a 99 to 04 IRS. It's a clean bolt-in package. And if you put all our stuff on it, all our stuff and, and, and a 99 to 04 IRS would be a fraction of the cost of trying to put a 550 in. And yes, the 550 is wider. So you'd have to widen out the back of the car and get special wheels. It's just, yeah, you know, I like things simple and easy. Uh, 550 IRS into a Fox is not simple. It's not easy. 99 to 04, simple and easy. So I um, need to thank Eric and Brad. They posted a lot of links on the, both the Crown Vic and the Marauder. Huh. So that's if people are interested in that. Yeah, Eric and Brad posted some links on the Marauder and Crown Vic. Uh, another thing I'd like to mention is we have so many people viewing uh, outside of the live, like thousands, versus the live show. Um, if you have questions, we review those. So um, just add yeah, your question you're, when you're, you're watching you're, it. If you're not watching live and watching the, uh, the rerun or replay, mm -hmm. uh, and you've got questions, uh, if you're a member of the Speed Therapy Society, you can send your questions in through there because that's, that's how I – pretty much uh, craft the programs I talk about. I talk about, you know, what questions that people send in. I talk about what you want to kind of learn about. Like today, we had a lot of people that want to know the, uh, you know, the, the benefit and value of uh, chassis support. So, yeah, you've got questions to send them in. And what is it? That it's called the Speed Therapy Society. Oh, you are Kenny so Browns. wrong. Kenny oh, Browns. my gosh. You, you have just ruined it. It is. It is a Facebook group. It's Kenny Brown Speed Therapy Society Facebook group. Facebook group. It's a private Facebook group. <laughs> ask, me, ask me about cars. You know, <laughs> just ask me about cars. Oh, I love harassing you. Okay, Christopher, another Speed Therapy Academy alumni has a question. Speaking of spring, I thought he was talking about springs, but he's talking about the season. Spring, spring. spring. How important is changing oil after getting the car out of storage? Uh, it's pretty important. I think we'll talk about more about that next week. That's just one of the things you should do. And that Herstover's from Bulgaria and yeah. watched every. Yeah, Her Herstover is one of our Speed Therapy Academy alumni, and he's from Bulgaria, and he had to get up and, and, and uh, he was in class at, at 2 a.m. his time. 
Okay, here's another question. And this is from Facebook user, and I just want to let you know, if, if your name's coming in by a Facebook user, we use uh, something called StreamYard, and they need your permission to post your name. So at the very top of the comments, there's an area where you can click yes to, uh, to give them permission to show your name. So anyway, Facebook user says, to help stiffen the chassis, is a four-point roll bar or a full cage better? Uh, well, I mean, a full cage is the best. I mean, the, you, more structure you put in, the better it gets. A four-point uh, roll bar, uh, yeah, depending on, on and where, where it mounts, uh, again, you're, if you're adding structure, it's going to get better. Uh, we used to have uh, street cages, which you haven't, haven't had a chance to bring back to the production yet. They're actually six-point, uh, actually eight-point. We had like the main hoop that bolted to the floor, and also the main hoop we had a tab that bolted to the, the B pillar uh, seat belt, seat belt thing, and then we had two braces that went back real close to the rear suspension, and then we had two braces that came down low and went like by the door sill and mounted up by your feet. So that added a lot. But even so, I mean, a good four point the one ninety sevens, and we have you know we add a one ninety sevens and five fifty. We put a four point in. Uh, that, that does a pretty good job. Yeah, it's, uh, structure structure is good. A full cage is you know the best, but uh, unless you're going racing, a full cage can be kind of a pain uh, getting in and out and doing things. Okay, Roy Wallace, uh, he's from Canada as well. We have a, a number of Canadians. How many of you are from Canada? Just uh, say a. So anyway, here we go. Roy Wallace, where would you suggest adding bracing ahead of the firewall for an SN95 with stock K-frame. Again, where would you suggest adding bracing ahead of the firewall for SN95? Uh, stretch tower brace. Uh, I mean, we had, we used to have a, a full range of uh, stretch tower braces, you know, before I had my health thing, and we haven't had a chance to, to bring uh, them back yet. The, the only one we have in production right now is for the 0304 Cobras. Uh, but it's, it's kind of like, I got a long list of products I want to bring to market because you know, what I introduced uh, Thursday night, uh, I've been working on for a very long time. It's just taken a lot of, it's taken all the oxygen out of any other uh, product, product development. Uh, but that's, that's done. We know we're starting to produce them. And uh, so I can start looking at other things that we can bring to market. Okay, I'm going to bring you back because he said, where would you suggest adding bracing? Well, now, what would you uh, it's a three-point stretch tower. A three-point stretch tower brace. Stretch tower, stretch tower firewall. Uh, it's you know people think that you put a stretch tower brace on at least with ours, uh, you're just adding one triangulation, but in reality you're adding four triangulations because if you look at it, you know from the top down, you've got the you know the, the diamond in the middle, uh, you know firewall, stretch tower, and across. But if you also look at the frame, the firewall, you get two more triangulations. So that, that's where I, I, I'd put the bracing is on the top because the strip, strip towers are going to move. Okay, so I, I have a, I'm going to plug the uh, Oklahoma Mustang Club of America. So the MCA National Mustang Show is going to be September 3rd through the 5th of this year in uh, Mustang, Mustang, Oklahoma. Mustang, Oklahoma, <laughs> yeah, Tulsa. That's cool. Yeah, sponsored by the OMC Oklahoma Mustang Club. So again, if you want to attend the national MCA event, it is in Mustang, Oklahoma. You can contact the Oklahoma Mustang Club, and their email address is Great Mustang Roundup. Yeah, it's in the comments. Yeah, it's in the probably put that in the in the comments or yeah. in the society. Yeah, actually, it is in there. Um, and Bob said his I should have known this. He has three piece wheels. Is he's going to go okay, three piece wheels series track? Yeah, I mean the uh, just the thing to do is I mean. I mean, they're, they're going to they're last a long time, uh, but just, just you know, every season, uh, we just, you know, inspect the wheels, just look for anything that looks suspicious, any, any kind of crack or anything. Uh, but, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll last a long time. I mean, Forge Line is looking at absolutely top of the line products. Okay, Rick Fowler has a big question. Your thoughts on the future of gas-powered Mustangs? Boy, that is a big question. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know that I'm totally equipped to answer that question, but I'll give you my thoughts. Uh, I don't know. Uh, certainly, I mean, we've got a few years of uh, gas-powered Mustang, but the Mach-E has come onto the scene, the Mustang Mach-E, which is an all-electric. Uh, it's, uh, it's branded as a Mustang, but because it actually has performance of a Mustang, 
uh, and they've got, you know, Ford has run some uh, electric uh, dry cars, you know, uh, Cobra Jet, not really Cobra Jet, but Cobra Jet type car, they're all electric, uh, 1400 horsepower, something like that. I, I, I just don't know. Uh, I saw somewhere just this past week, maybe some spy shots of the next generation Mustang, and it did have exhaust, it had you know, uh, two, uh, twin tip exhaust. Uh, on it. So I'm guessing the next generation, you know, who knows? It might get that new Godzilla motor for all I know. Oh, I forgot to mention that. Roy, Roy, when you were talking about the Marauder, you thought the Godzilla motor in the Marauder would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that would be pretty cool. Those that aren't familiar, the, the new Godzilla motor is what's in the, the Ford Heavy Duties. And it is, it's a push rod motor. Uh, it, you, can, you can easily get a bucket of horsepower out of them. Uh, they're really cool. And if you want to know more, we had Evan Smith on Evan, last week. Yeah, or last week. Evan was on last week. And if you go to, to Evan Smith's Revan Evan mm -hmm. YouTube, he's got like maybe five or six uh, videos on, on the Godzilla motor. Uh, but there, you can make you can make big horsepower with a push rod motor. Uh, I, th I think Ford should have done this motor a long time ago instead of the uh, the, the modular, at least the, the two valve and three valves. Once they got the four valve, and all of a sudden they got the, you know, starting to get it right. We got the Coyote. They got it. They nailed it. But, uh, yeah, a Godzilla motor and, and a Crown Vic would be would be pretty cool. Okay. And, and Eric, bring up. I'm going to I'm just gonna say Eric. I know I'll butcher your last name. It's probably easy. Ryan Engel. When drawing the center line of the control arms to determine real center, the center line should go through the ball joint and the pivot point, correct? Not just the center line of the control arms. The answer is, yeah, anytime we're doing geometry, it, it's going to be, you're looking at the pickup points. And, you know, the ball joints on the outside, the control arm mounting is the inside. If you really want to know about geometry, join the next uh, Speed Therapy Academy. I, I spent a lot of time on geometry. Uh, and I give away a lot of secrets. And the, uh, the other secret is, when we do the Speed Therapy Academy, every week there's a PowerPoint. And the PowerPoint is is in always in the, uh, the resource section uh, for the academy, so people can back and look at it uh, or watch it, you know, again and again if they want. Yep. And we have a lot of people do that because they say they don't really get everything the first time through, but they really like to go back and look at it. The on, only lesson that's not in the uh, in the resources is geometry. Uh, it's like, I mean, I, I I talk about secret stuff, and we talk a lot about uh, suspension geometry. Because you, know, you look around, I'm probably you know, the guy in um, in the Mustang world that really understands suspension geometry. Because you know, I've been doing it since 87. Okay, we have a question from Eric Stadel. He has a question. Is there any way to reduce the NVH gear noise coming from the third link on the S197? Uh, yeah, the NVH gear noise is not the third link. It's the gears themselves. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's if you've changed gears, uh, it's really hard to get them set up so there's there's no noise, especially if you go deep, the deeper the deeper the deeper gear that you go, like you know, the the higher the the number, uh, the more uh, noise you're going to pick up. Uh, yeah, or or if the the rear end's getting kind of tired, you know, start making noises. I mean, the you know, that's why on 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 the rear grip kit. And we've got a, we've got a rod end at the chassis, uh, but at, at the axle, we leave the rubber uh, bushing uh, mm -hmm. on the axle. You know, we don't swap that out just for that reason, to try to reduce some of that NVH from the axle. I know a lot of people have like a rod end in, in the axle, and we, we just don't do that. That really is going to uh, generate some, some NVH through it. But, uh, yeah, get I mean, you really need to be looking at, at, at the rear gears and, uh, and see if you can either get them realigned better or if they're worn out you know, or, if, or if you go deeper, you go like, I mean, we were typically on 373 and 410s. If you start going deeper than that, then you're, you're definitely going to pick up noise. Okay. Uh, just, this is just some uh, chatter that's going on that I thought was interesting. Hi, Ernie. Uh, from Ernie and McCrony, he said all wheel drive is next for the Mustang. Uh, you know, I would, I would not discount that. And the reason I said that if anybody ever looked at the uh, the front spindle on the 550 cars it actually 
almost looks like a rear spindle because the center is hollow. Now, why would they have a, a front spindle that's, you know, the the bolt, the, the, the yeah, bearing package, bearing pack bolts on, you know, it just bolts to the, the spindle, but there's a big hole in the center. And the only reason I think that they would do that is if at some point they're thinking about, you know, putting an axle up front, which which could be all-wheel drive. And, and if I was doing it, I, I'd put electric motors up there. So uh, Eric Rangel said, uh, Randy Post ran a Tesla in the Pikes Peak hill climb, did really well even after wrecking it. <laughs> yeah. Those are yeah, sorry, I, I saw that. The uh, <laughs> Yeah, he, he doesn't make many mistakes. I'm, I'm going to say it's the car that did it, not Randy. Randy. Yeah, he's a good driver. Okay, and here's some excitement. Um, Facebook user, we don't know which Facebook user this is, but just ordered a new F-250 with a Godzilla engine in it. He's looking forward to it. Woo! And uh, Brian West uh, comments, might be an aluminum block Zilla, but probably only a 6.2. So, and then one more comment, and then we'll get back to some questions. Um, NASCAR announces that next-gen NASCAR vehicle will be introduced soon. Possibly will be on track in 2022. It is a hybrid engine with batteries, six-speed trans, and single nut hub tire and wheel retainer. Whoa! <laughs> NASCAR is actually moving into the 20th century. Okay, and this is and a NASCAR historically has has really poo-pooed technology uh, because, like, Formula One is all about technology. NASCAR is all about entertainment. So the cars have pretty much been the same for a very long time. Just going to fuel injection was like a huge deal. Now it sounds like you're going to center line wheels, which is like the rest of the racing world, and uh, batteries even, and a hybrid. That'd be, kind of, that'd be kind of interesting. So uh, this is the last call for questions. So if you have any more questions, feel free to put them in the comments and you know, answer another one or two. And while we're waiting for the questions to come in, we're going to talk about the reveal that we had on Thursday night and um, how the people in the reveal, if they order, they get to get the special driver coaching bonus session yeah. with you. So yep. they need to order by this Sunday. And then next Thursday, we're having a bonus driver session. And all the uh, Speed Therapy alumni are invited. Yeah, just uh, the thing is to send in their videos. And you know, we'll kind of talk through. And I'll do a little coaching on driving. Uh, it's something that we did we did for the Speed Therapy Society or the Academy. Uh -huh. Uh, it was the last two weeks or so. Yeah. We we did uh, guys sent in their videos, and we you know, all sat through. And I gave them my my thoughts on you know where the car should be, where they should turn, and things like that. Yeah, so, it's pretty interesting. I think they learned a lot from that. So this will be just a little sample of the yeah, Speed Therapy I can't, Academy. Can't wait. The Joe gets back to Eagles Canyon and tries driving again. I know. Has he done that year? Is it coming up? Uh, it's coming up in the beginning of March. So I gave him a whole bunch of tips on. Uh, how to be quicker. Okay, so I don't see any more questions here. So again, next week we will have um, Paul Dondero. Um, <laughs> We're working on this technology thing. <laughs> Sorry, Paul, I know you're there. And then, um, what are you talking about? The spring, what's your tune up on your spring car? Preparing, preparing for spring. We're talking about Cliff's uh, FR500S update. Mm -hmm. Yep. Big update. Show some pictures. And we don't know what we're going to do for show and tell you. That always kind of like pops up in the middle of the week. Of course, send your questions in uh, through the Speed Therapy Society. Uh, if you've got question, more questions, if you're in the, the, the after group that, you know, watches the, the reruns, uh, please send your questions in through the Speed Therapy Society. And, uh, you, know, I'll, you know, I'll do the best I can to answer them. Like I say, if, if I know the answer, I'll tell you. If I don't, I'll tell you that too. I'm just not, not good at BS. It just doesn't work for me. Unlike a lot of people, a lot of people sell parts in the aftermarket. Okay, well, great. Good session, considering we had to adapt adapt, adapt two adaptions today, adaptations. We had to switch from the seat to the wheel and from uh, Paul to the Crown Vic. But the Crown Vic was a question. Yeah. And you know, my, my closing comments is use sunscreen. I mean, I, I can't stress that enough. Uh, if you've ever seen anybody this passed from, from uh, melanoma, it's, it's, it's tragic and it's ugly. So that's why I go to the, the, the I, since Paul passed, I go to the dermatologist every three months. I mean, I just, just like clockwork. I mean, I'm just not going to take any chances. And my youngest son, too, is going to, Adam, who's also a redhead, he's going to the dermatologist, and they found a little spot in the middle of on his back a couple months back that they cut out, but it's you know, not, not to worry. They got it in time. 
So it's serious stuff. So it's serious stuff. Uh, sunscreen and hats. Okay. I need to wear a hat. I got all kinds of little things in my head. The dermatologists, they go crazy in my head. Zzz, with their cryoblaster. Cryoblaster 5000. <laughs> So anyway, I'm glad you could join us this week. Uh, thank everybody that, that uh, was at the reveal Thursday night. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you this Thursday night in the, in, in the bonus session, bonus driver session. And uh, until next week, you know, keep the shiny side up. And uh, we're looking forward to spring. I hope you are too.